Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of React Native Radio. Today on our panel, we have Jamin Holmgren. Hey everybody. Chris Reyes. Hey everybody. And I am Josh Justice, and uh, thanks everyone for joining. Today we're gonna to be talking a bit about native code, getting under the hood of the JavaScript and getting down into the native iOS or Android code. When I'm building a new product, G2i is the company that I call on to help me find a developer who can build the first version. G2i is a hiring platform run by engineers that matches you with React, React Native, GraphQL, and mobile engineers who you can trust. Whether you are a new company building your first product or an established company that wants additional engineering help, G2i has the talent you need to accomplish your goals. Go to devchat.tv slash G2i to learn more about what G2i has to offer. In my experience, G2i has linked up with experienced developers that can fit my budget, and the G2i staff are friendly and easy to work with. They know how product development works and can help you find the perfect engineer for your stack. Go to devchat.tv slash G2i to learn more about G2i. Uh, Jamin, you have some uh, thoughts and background about this. Why don't you uh, get kissed off on the topic? Yeah, absolutely. So native code in React Native is kind of a topic fairly near and dear to my heart, although um, I, I haven't done as much of it as maybe I would uh, maybe I'd like to. However, one of my goals for 2020 is to expand into that. Uh, I'm working on a, a course for our Infinite Red Academy, and I'm, I'm doing some other things as well, like uh, a workshop at Chain React on it. So it's going to be kind of a focus point for me this year, and I'm really looking forward to all of that. I think the biggest thing to start off with is why native code? I thought we were doing React Native, so we didn't have to do native code, right? There's Objective-C, there's Java. Why don't we just use JavaScript? Why can't we just use uh, you know, React Native uh, side of things? Uh, I don't know, Christopher or Josh, if you have any thoughts on that before I launch into my, my part of that, but go ahead if you do. Yeah, I, I, I as well don't have a ton of experience, but I definitely see the benefit of it. I always kind of thought of it as a way to leverage for code reuse. Uh, so if you have prior native code, like Java for an Android app or your Swift or Objective-C, it's a way to kind of leverage that in your React Native app instead of doing a full JavaScript rewrite. I don't know if that's kind of been your guys' experience um, or if you've actually had experience with that. I'm curious to see how that's gone. That's definitely uh, a scenario where, where it's very useful. I think uh, reusing third-party native code as well can be an option. Um, you know, if there's an iOS or an Android library that does what you need, um, instead of re-implementing that in JavaScript, even if it's possible to do it, you may want to hook into that, that native code. I think the, the other aspect of it is the native functionalities that the OSs provide. You know, ultimately somebody is mapping the JavaScript code down to the native level. Right. Um, and I should say, I always want to make say this precisely because folks can sometimes misunderstand that you know your JavaScript is still running as JavaScript uh, in your app in production, um, but it's executing native code at various times in various ways. So whether it's the React Native library itself that's um, booting the app, well, not booting the app, well, I guess they set up the native code that boots up the app, but whether it's the React Native code itself that executes the JavaScript and puts the UI elements on the screen um, or gives you an API to hook into some device capability like storage, um, or if it's a third party uh, library that's like a lot of the React Native community libraries or just other third party libraries that are exposing native APIs to the JavaScript layer, or whether you yourself are writing custom you know, native code on your project one way or another, all of the JavaScript ultimately gets down to something native that's running underneath the hood. And uh, another thing that, I, a realization I had in the last few months as to why this happens a lot is just, and I'm sure this is very obvious for, for a number of folks, but for me, it took a little while. Compared to web development, just how many more APIs are available on mobile devices and the fact that React Native uh, allows us to get down to all of them. But React Native Core itself doesn't expose all of them. And so, you know, there's, when your application needs it, or when you decide to make a library to do it, you can write a wrapper to get down to that native code. Whereas in the, in the browser, we just don't have those options. The browser is exposed what APIs they expose, and that's all you get. Yeah, that's a really good overview, Josh. Um, that, that I think hits all of the points uh, of, of why you would want to use uh, native code, why you need to use native code. I mean, ultimately, that's what React Native is. It's a, it's, it's a bunch of glue code um, connecting together the JavaScript side of things, uh, passing over the bridge, and then 
and then running that uh, as native code on on the native code side. And, and that was a, a point well made about how the JavaScript's not compiled. Um, there are there are some systems that compile down to native code. Uh, I used to use a system called Ruby Motion where you could write Ruby and then it would compile down to actual native code. Like if you looked at the code afterward, it would look almost like you wrote it in Objective-C and you compiled it. Um, there was another one uh, called Titanium, uh, I think, uh, that uh, took JavaScript or a JavaScript-like language and compiled that down to native code. And there are pluses and minuses for the, that approach, uh, but the the approach that React Native has taken is to take this bundle of JavaScript and then and then have it run as JavaScript and then connect in with the native side of things. Before we get too deeply into this, I should mention that the Facebook uh, React Native core team is working on a thing called Turbo Modules, which um, eliminates the bridge. And let's talk about the bridge for a second. So the bridge is essentially where it serializes up basically commands into a string, you know, a JSON string. And then it sends those over the bridge uh, to the native side. The native side re receives this string and then turns it back into an object, looks at it, sees what it needs to do, the data it needs to give to whatever command it's giving, and then gives that command. The problem is that serializing every command, sending it over the wire, deserializing it, is slow. It's asynchronous. It's slow. It uh, it it. You want to avoid doing this too many times. Let's say you're doing an animation or something. You don't want to be sending uh, stuff over uh, as a string. You don't want to be serializing everything every time. It's just a, a lot of additional computing power. It's almost like reaching out to a server from a web page or something. And maybe not quite on that level because it's all on the same device. But it's still pretty slow compared to just a function call. So Turbo Modules allows you to call directly and using uh, the uh, JavaScript um, native in a interface. I think it's is the JNI, right? Uh, am I doing that right? There's that also sounds the, familiar. There's also the Java na native interface, so I may be mixing those two up right now. But it's uh, it's using using that as uh, as a way to call Java and Objective C APIs directly. But yeah, I, I look at uh, writing native code. The one, what I really look at it is as a React Native developer, you really need to have as many tools in your in your pocket as possible to get, to be able to make the right decisions in terms of trade-offs. So uh, as you said, you can maybe rewrite a library in uh, JavaScript, entirely in JavaScript, and it's totally possible to do that. You may not have time, and there's already a, an SDK out there. There's already a library out there that does what you need it to do. And being able to integrate that with your JavaScript, but using native code uh, is another kind of superpower that you would have as a React Native developer. Um, but many, many developers, React, many React Native developers come in from the web and they are maybe a little bit intimidated by the native side of things because it feels a little magic. It's a very foreign uh, uh, environment. It's also like a lot of the a lot of the tools aren't there. You don't have like the same inspector that you might have with a web page or, or uh, you know, Reactatron on the on the uh, React Native side or something like that. So it just feels very intimidating. Uh, but I think that it's really uh, it's one of those things where once you can drop down to native, it just gives you so much more confidence that you can get done what you need to get done. And this is actually one of the big benefits of React Native over Flutter too, uh, because in React Native you can mix and match native code and JavaScript in a much more seamless way uh, than, than with Flutter. So yeah, the, with all that said, basically, the, the, I, I think it's one of the tools that, that a React Native developer needs in their, in their tool, tool belt. This brings a question to mind uh, based on something we talked about a few weeks ago, Jamin. Um, we were talking about our backgrounds and different programming languages and things like that and how we didn't want folks to feel pressured to pick up a new language as like a new JavaScript developer. Like, you know, you take some time, a few years to get a language under your belt. And so applying this to native code, I, I wonder if, you know, I, I, I would probably say that I don't think every React Native developer needs to know native coding. Right. Um, sure. Certainly not right away, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, if you, in fact, I, I might go so far as to say is if you're writing native code on like every single story you're working on in React Native, that's mm -hmm. probably something to be avoided. Like, I mean, it, yeah. maybe if someone's app has that, yeah, then maybe sure. that's totally fine. But it's like, you know, when you can abstract that away to some degree and get 
you know, a bunch of your time spent just in JavaScript. That's a big part of the benefit of React Native. But yeah, would, would, would you agree from a timing standpoint, you know, we sort of said that like, hey, you know, you know, it might be, you might be in one language for five years and then you're like, cool, I've got that program language under my belt, time to move on. Um, yeah, would you agree just that encouragement for junior developers, developers who are new to JavaScript, it's like, hey, don't feel a pressure to need to get into the native code. Although, you know, when you're ready, it's an important and very valuable thing for a React Native developer to have. I, I do agree with that with one caveat, uh, and that is that you're kind of diving into this, um, this world where you're overlapping two disciplines. Uh, so if, if you were, for example, an iOS developer, it'd probably make more sense to just focus on Swift. If you're just, a, if you're, if you're focusing on being a web developer, then it makes sense to focus on doing JavaScript. We do kind of live in this gray area between two worlds. And that sort of maybe puts some pressure on React Native developers in particular to learn really three languages. And that's JavaScript, Java, and Objective-C. Now, I know you can do Kotlin and Swift as well. Um, we'll probably talk about that in a little bit. But, uh, but it does put pressure on you to do that, even if you're newer in your career. Uh, the good news is that most of the time, you're just writing a little bit of glue code. You're not having to entirely build things from scratch. Um, so that, that makes it a lot easier. That all definitely makes sense. Yeah, I just want to jump back a couple points where uh, Jamon just kind of said it was just another tool to have in your belt. And I think it might be something uh, you just pull out in certain use cases. So even the React Native docs kind of say if you have like a specific threading or a heavy task where you don't want to go over the bridge, this is when something like this comes in. And it might not even be something you do on your own if you have access to an actual native developer. It might be something you partner with them on and then you kind of plug that into your native app. Yeah, totally. Uh, it's You're exactly right. There's a, there's a uh, like, like I said, it's mostly you're writing glue code usually. And then when you do have specific needs, you can you can go and find a developer who's who has more um, more experience writing native code. That's what we do at Infinite Red. It's is basically uh, if we have a need to write native code, which is actually less often than you might think. Um, although I think sometimes we could benefit maybe from reaching for native code in some cases where we're kind of bending over backwards to make it work in JavaScript. Um, but uh, but then here's the other thing: the the new the new like Turbo modules uh, architecture is actually going to um, make uh, writing native code a little bit less necessary in some cases as well because you have that direct access, uh, not having to go over the bridge in the same specific way. So, um, so yeah, totally. It's, uh, but I do, I do think it's a, it's a tool to have in the tool belt. It's something that if you just have a, a little bit of familiarity, you understand what things are, are happening. I mean, with Objective-C, you look at Objective-C and you read Objective-C, uh, you understand what's a method call. What is the name of the method in this situation? By the way, in Objective-C, it's not obvious what the method name is when you look at the code. It's actually not because Objective-C has a keyword mixed with variable, you know, argument mixed with keyword, you know, and those keywords make up the, the method name and the argument list is not all at the end like in every other programming language just about. Uh, so it, it, it just kind of throws you for a loop. What are all these strange square brackets? Why would you use square brackets? Are we, make, are we making a bunch of arrays here? Like what, what's going on? Um, you're not, hint. <laughs> you're, you're calling methods. Uh, so, so Objective-C has this kind of strange syntax from the 80s. I think it was invented in about 1984 or something like that, 1986. Um, it's been around for a long time. I was only a couple of years old when it was invented. and. Uh, it, it just kind of uh, like, it just has this archaic feel to it. Um, I would also like to mention while I'm on that topic, uh, you might be thinking, why would I learn Objective-C if we have Swift? And React Native does work with Swift. Um, but I would say Objective-C is still worthwhile to learn, at least at, as of this moment in 2020. If you're listening to this in 2022 or 2024, this that may not be the case, <laughs> but... Uh, but in but right now it is worth doing uh, because uh, honestly everything in React Native itself is written in Objective C, uh, and when you go to Swift you actually introduce a new build pipeline. Um, you actually have more moving parts, uh, so you can use Swift, but it it adds some additional kind of um, some ad additional overhead, some additional setup that has to happen 
and you still have to write a little bit of glue code to make that work. So you might as well just go with Objective C. It's not that much different than Swift in the in the ways that matter. And uh, then when you're talking talking about Java and Kotlin, I think that Java is a little bit easier to swallow than Objective C, uh, but Kotlin is also a little bit easier to move to, toward. So you have kind of the same distance there, where you're you're kind of uh, trying to figure out, you know, is this worth going to Kotlin or do I just stick with Java? Um, I think it really depends on how much code you're writing. If you're going to write a ton of ton of native code, then you probably want to do the extra work to bring in Swift or Kotlin. But if you're not, if you're just writing some glue code, stick with Objective C and Java. It's going to make your life easier. Yeah, the documentation in React Native for going to native modules is targeted on Objective C and in Java. And I think it's probably related to, you know, React Native has been around for a while. And so I think it predates Kotlin and Swift. And so that's why a lot of its internal code base in the, is in those languages. At least on the iOS side, in at least the last time I kind of dove in, Objective C has a lot more flexibility than Swift, yeah. and so some of the dynamic things that React Native needs to do, I think Objective C is going to continue to be um, just better suited for that. And so I don't imagine that the internals of React Native would be rewritten over to Swift for those. So there's going to be an anchor of React Native itself in those older languages um, yeah. for for a while, if not indefinitely. Yeah, totally. It, that definitely is the case. And so I would just recommend, you know, Objective-C and Java are fine. Learn them. It's not that big of a deal. You can learn them. I know I know that you can. It's, it's uh, uh, you're probably going to need a little bit of help doing that. But, you know, there's, there's some, there's some good uh, resources out there. But, but when you do, I think that you're going to find that that's, that, that comfort level is going to make you a lot better React Native engineer. So one of the common things that we run into at Infinite Red is that we have native SDKs that need to be integrated. So we have, uh, for example, PayPal has, the, this is a real thing. We have, a, we have a potential project coming up. And in their, their case, they have a PayPal um, SDK that's integrated that allows you to take a picture of a, of a credit card or just hold a credit card in front of the camera. And it will recognize and pull out the details of the credit card into um, you know, uh, basically just pull out the, the number and the expiration and the date and uh, the, uh, the the name and all that from the credit card, which is which is pretty a pretty cool feature. And they have a native SDK for this. Uh, I haven't looked into it enough to see if there's a uh, an Android version of it, but I know it exists on iOS. Infinite Red is a U.S. based consultancy specializing in React and React Native. They do mobile app and web design and development. They are deeply involved in the React and React Native open source communities, publish the React Native newsletter with 10,000 subscribers, and are involved with the React Native core development. If you have a project and need design or engineering help from an experienced team to take it all the way from concept to completion, get in touch with Infinite Red. Also check out Chain React, the React Native conference, which is hosted by Infinite Red in July in Portland with 500 developers from all around the world. You can find them at infinite.red. Make sure to mention you heard about them in this ad. There's no integration. There's no third party that's already been written for, for that particular SDK in React Native. So you can't just pull in some you know, NPM module and then start using it. And so what do you do? Do you tell, do you tell the client or your boss, um, sorry, I can't do it? <laughs> or do you try to rewrite that functionality in JavaScript? You know, Good luck with that. Uh, no, the, the best thing to do is to integrate that with uh, the native, uh, the native and the J JavaScript side of things. So, in the React Native docs, there are there is a native modules um, section under the guides, uh, the iOS and the Android guides. I'm going to actually make sure that we get that into the the show notes. Um, but basically. Uh, if you look at this, it's actually kind of set up as a little bit of a tutorial. I guess it's a guide. And it allows you to go through and actually build uh, a native module uh, in the iOS. Uh, in the, on the iOS side, you're building, uh, a, being able to access the iOS calendar from, from JavaScript. Now, that's something that you can already find a, a third-party module in React Native to do. But let's say you wanted to do that in some custom way. They actually walk through using uh, Objective-C to glue those things together. You write a little bit of Objective-C, you use things like RCT export module, which is a 
a macro. Um, if you're not familiar with macros, basically it allows the compiler to rewrite code before it compiles the code. So it'll go in there and add some stuff or change some stuff in the code for you to allow um, for more concise code. You don't have to write all that glue code. You just put in a macro and it does, does the job. It's very similar to a function, but it happens before you compile the code. And then on the Android side, you are setting up uh, using the, the Toast example. So Toast is like a pop-up on the bottom of your screen, um, or I might, might be able to do it on the top of the screen as well. Uh, that uh, allows kind of it's just like an alert, but it's an asynchronous alert. There's no, you know, there's no buttons or anything like that. It just shows you an alert, like, hey, you know, uh, I just saved this or something. Um, and so you write some Java, and so you actually create a Java file, and you write some, you write some uh, some Java code, and and you get things kind of all lined up, and then you connect it in with JavaScript as well. And so uh, feel free to go through those those examples. I think they're they're really good. They give you a taste of what it's like to write some native code, and they don't take very long. And at the end, you'll have uh, maybe a little more of an idea of of how all of this kind of works together. There's a lot of stuff in there that you won't understand, uh, and that's okay. But just try try connecting it up and see how it goes. Yeah, I would encourage folks to check them out as well. Um, I've been through the iOS one. Um, I, it went fairly smoothly for me. I have done some iOS development in the background, in, in, in my background. So I should probably try the Android one, which I haven't done Android development to see how hard that is or isn't. Um, but I think it's a great thing for folks to do if you're looking for something to do on the side or if you have a little downtime, I guess at the end of the year might've been a time that folks would have had downtime, but it's now the next year. Um, but uh, you know, to me, it feels like if I'd never touched native modules before and a requirement came in that was like, hey, we need this feature and you would have to write a native integration to do it. That would have been very overwhelming to me. But having gone through it once myself in a non-urgent way, it's like, OK, like I have a, a certain comfort level. And so it's like, OK, I could I could I could more easily like decide if I could do that native integration. Whereas if I hadn't tried it, it's like, oh, yeah, that's that's not something I've done. I, I just feel anxiety. Um, and if you go through it, you know, if you know, as we said before, if you're just pretty new to JavaScript and you're like, I don't think I can handle another language right now, totally fine. If you get into it and you're like, yeah, this just feels too overwhelming. It feels like it's too much of a different tool chain. I'm not ready right now. That's totally fine. Like now, you know, um, or you may find that you get down a certain level in it. And so I just think that familiarity with the native level uh, to go back to something Jamin was saying earlier is really helpful. It gives you a sense of your tool chain. And even if you never end up writing native modules there, the understanding of how the pieces fit together is, is valuable. Yeah, that's what I thought was really interesting because it, you, in the actual sample code, you see them import the React Native Bridge. And then they even have like a specific emphasis on how to name your, your native bundles so it translates over to JavaScript. So this kind of reminds me about uh, two years ago when like I first started working with like React Native Camera. You had to do a lot more of native implementation when you link the package than you do now. So this kind of article would have helped a lot. It's, it's a really great resource for sure. Yeah, it totally is. Um, yeah, I, I think that um, one of the things that is helpful if you do this um, is to understand the syntax of the language itself. Uh, so when you look at, for example, you're going to see the one, one, I guess the first code block in the iOS side of things, the import side, you can probably figure that out. It looks not that different than, than JavaScript. It's just, it's got like a, a pound sign instead of just the word import. And then it has angle brackets, you know, for, for some reason. Uh, and you may also see sometimes they use quotes and there's a different reason for that. Uh, so they'll use angle brackets for importing some things and, and quotes for importing other things. And there's a, it's a .h file. What's a .h file? I thought we were working with uh, Objective-C, for example. Well, it's a header file. And that's that kind of comes from its uh, C roots because Objective-C comes from C. Um, and then you'll also see at interface and then some names with some other symbols. And then you'll see at end. Uh, and at interface kind of looks like TypeScript. So if you're, you know, if you know about TypeScript, then it may make kind of make sense. But why are we even defining this this interface? Um, and then uh, uh, I, and then you have an implementation below that also imports some things, and it's an at implementation, an at end, 
and then you have some capitalized. It's it's just different. Like the the syntax is just different. It it looks quite a bit different. If you look at the the Android guide, on the other hand, the Java. So there's this sort of kind of meme that goes around that like, uh, you know, Java is to JavaScript like car is to carpet, right? Uh, and it's funny and it gets a lot of shares. It's not totally true. JavaScript does have some some roots in Java and uh, some some people may fight me on this, but it's true. It does not, <laughs> it, it, it definitely does have some roots in Java. They are based on at least, at the very least, they're based on similar languages. They use curly braces. They use, um, uh, you know, some of the same uh, ways of, uh, of writing things. If you look at it, it almost looks a little bit like TypeScript. And uh, it's, it's kind of like a, a much more verbose TypeScript in some ways. Uh, now, if you get deeper, then yeah, there's some pretty deep changes or differences between the two. Uh, but, but superficially, they do have actually a lot of similarities and there are some things that, that come from them. So Java is probably a little easier for a, a JavaScript developer, especially a little more experienced or TypeScript developer, a little more experienced developer to understand. But when you look through it, you're going to be able to see what's going on. Still, knowing some of the syntax and understanding what some of the symbols do and why you would write out you know, private, static, final, string, you know, before you write your, your variable instead of just putting const, uh, that would be that would be helpful to people, I think. Yeah, I think the syntax, because they're both the C-based languages, but I think the paradigm is where I think might trip people up because, you know, in JavaScript, you can, you can approach it, especially with TypeScript, in an object-oriented manner, where both Objective-C and, and Java are object-oriented languages. So I think that is a little bit of a, might be a bit of a learning curve if you're not familiar with that realm. So I'm trying to find the resource right now. Actually, there's a code clinic on like LinkedIn learning where it's like a, you do object-oriented exercises and you do it across multiple languages. And one of them is Java and one's Objective-C. So I'm trying to dig up that resource right now because it's a really good resource and you kind of see how to solve the same problem across multiple languages. So, I mean, as an exercise, you could do that with JavaScript as well and kind of use that object-oriented paradigm. So when you do dive into native code, it's not this completely like foreign realm. And I think, uh, you know, coming from React, React Native, that has more of a functional feel. So you're kind of switching paradigms too, which kind of, you know, for me, when you're in that kind of mind frame, it's really confusing to jump between because sometimes, you know, when you're in an object-oriented like land, you take a couple extra steps to do certain things versus how you would do it in JavaScript. So it's definitely a learning curve, but once you kind of get it, it's some, it's like riding a bike. You kind of get comfortable and you're like, oh yeah, I'm doing this now. Yeah, very good point. And ECMAScript, you know, JavaScript classes, the syntax is based on Java. It's very, very, very similar. And so that's going to feel fairly familiar to folks as well. Whereas Objective-C diverge in the language, you know, a bunch of programming languages are all very influenced by one another and Objective-C diverge much, much further back. Whereas I feel like, at least in my circles, Java was sort of like the programming language. It was very much dominant at a certain point in time. And so many, many languages that have come since then, Java was sort of the standard, standard from which they either stuck with it or intentionally went in a different direction. Um, with like Lisp-inspired languages these days, there's some other kind of threads um, but yeah, there's a lot of reasons in the history of programming languages that Java is going to be likely to be more familiar. Totally. So as, there's actually kind of another aspect of, of writing native code, and that's building UI components as well. So you can build, like so far I've been talking about native modules uh, where you're just kind of connecting up some backend code and you're you're wanting to, to, uh, to use some native, uh, you know, APIs or something like that. But what if you actually want to build a whole component in in uh, in native code? And I've actually used this as a fairly um, effective sales tool, so to speak, uh, when I'm talking to potential clients who are maybe a little bit worried about React Native's performance or something like that. I just say, you know what? If we find that in a certain case, a particular component is not performing how well we want it to, we can always drop down and actually just write that component in native and then hook that up to the JavaScript side and it's good to go. There are additional guides for writing native UI components. The differences primarily are that you're going to be creating at least until... I should caveat here, at least until the fabric uh, rewrite or uh, kind of 
change of architecture is, is done. Fabric is basically a, a rewrite of the UI uh, architecture to some degree of uh, React Native. But when you do this uh, with the current architecture, you're gonna be building uh, view managers and these view managers are going to, they're, they're very special classes that, uh, that React Native knows how to access in order to, um, to build and manage, to create and manage uh, native views using JavaScript. So this kind of like connects everything up and view managers become the way that they communicate. So uh, there is a way for, so the example for iOS is the map view. Uh, so you can actually build a, a map kit map view in iOS and make it usable from JavaScript. And there's a little more wiring up that has to happen. Um, but by the end, you should have a working example on the native side or on the, on the, sorry, on the Android native side, this, they, they do an example for building an image view in, in JavaScript. Clearly you can do images in React Native, that's not an issue, but, um, but, but it, lets, it gives you a good example of something that's familiar. And again, you're creating a, a view manager that allows you to create a new view and then manage it uh, using React properties and things like that. Um, and you can also expose, uh, you know, property setters and getters uh, using using annotations and stuff like that. So um, this again allows you to wire up between JavaScript and Java, you know, a connection across the bridge. We're going to have to probably revisit this in about a year, guys, because the the architecture is going to change over that amount of time, and it's going to be interesting to see how it changes and then uh, how it impacts like what we do when we build things. Your point about um, decisions with clients and being hesitant about React Native and the ability to drop down relates to one of my favorite soapboxes, which is about performance. And uh, you can say, well, hey, I want everything in my app to be as performant as possible. And JavaScript is interpreted, and so it's less performant, and you're going through a bridge, and the bridge really does absolutely have performance implementation, impl implications, so I don't want to minimize that. But the idea that like oh, just every code path should be as, as uh, optimized as possible. You know, one thing about that is uh, JavaScript is actually pretty performant these days. Um, on another Dev Chat podcast a year or two ago, uh, a guest mentioned that the JavaScript is probably the most optimized dynamic language of all time, just because think about how broadly it's used and uh, Chrome in particular, but Apple and Firefox as well, just pouring into making that as optimized as possible and finding ways to intelligently detect. Um, they are, uh, some uh, instructors will point out that it, it is technically a compiled language in the sense that the JavaScript interpreters do compile down from the, it's not literally going through line by line of text as it's executing it, like it does a pass and like converts the JavaScript into some internal representation. So it, in some sense, JavaScript is compiled, although it, you know, it's probably misleading if you say that too much. Um, but so there's, there's super optimizations that happen there at the engine level. And of course, the Hermes engine was created by Facebook for Android to be super optimized for the React Native use case. Um, so that's one reason in which uh, to not be too concerned about uh, performance from the JavaScript side. And the other side, of course, is just to say that, you know, when it comes down to it, like, you know, not every code path in your app is executed the same amount of times. And so, you know, that one screen of your app that's displaying thousands of records like you're going to find as you test your app, as you test the performance, that that's going to be the place that things really slow down and everything else, the JavaScript is absolutely negligible. Um, and just the, the amount of time that you get from executing the super compiled code, it doesn't make a difference. And so I think it's really a, a fallacy to say, hey, we're going to build our app with native code because performance. Um, when the, the runtime performance in most, in many cases, and I would say most cases, a lot of the time um, is not going to make a difference. And thinking about the, uh, the differences you make in terms of development time, not being able to have hot reloading and or, or the new fast refresh that React Native has, um, that makes a huge difference on how quickly you can develop and push out features for users. The ability to do over-the-air updates with Code Push and with Expo to roll out features for users very quickly and fix bugs for users very quickly. That's not just a selfish developer experience focus. That makes a real difference in your business and your customers and how you can deliver things. Um, and of course, there are lots and lots of trade-offs between native code and, and uh, you know fully native apps and React Native. But I, I would just uh, agree that like you know. Going, being hesitant about React Native because JavaScript is running, um, there's 
there's a lot of reasons to be to worry of that. And all these escape hatches we have to go down into the native code there is a, a great way to give you options, uh, you know, so that you won't be stuck with a performance problem. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and honestly, if you take that additional time that you learn or that, that you gain from, from using React Native and you put more of that time, not all of it, but some of that time into performance optimizations, often you can end up with a better user experience than spending all of your time building two apps, one on Android and one on iOS, and uh, trying to optimize as you go. Now, this, this sounds familiar to a, an argument that the Cordova people, <laughs> of which I used to do some, uh, you know, used to also say the, the amount of time you save building a Cordova app, you can just put into performance optimizations and you'll end up with a good user experience. The reality was that you just couldn't really achieve that, even if you had additional time. I think React Native hits that right balance between the two. Um, but you do have addition, because it's cross-platform, you do have a massive savings because you're not having to build a second app and you can put those into performance optimizations. You can write native code when you need to and uh, and achieve the performance you need to. Now, I, I think that when we came into React Native, we were doing iOS uh, native and we were starting to do some Android native. We were extremely dubious as to how much code could be reused between the two platforms because we'd heard this before. Um, the only one that really delivered was Cordova and of course it under delivered on user experience. You know, other, other frameworks never seem to have parity between the two, uh, two platforms. And so our goal going into React Native was if we can write 50% of the app, like maybe just the UI layer in JavaScript and the rest has to be done in, in native code, we're still, we're still way ahead. Like this, this, this achieves what we were hoping to get. My hope was that we'd probably hit around 80% uh, code reuse between the two platforms. The reality is we've built many apps with zero native code, custom native code written. We've built many more with over 90% code reuse and just a little bit of uh, native code. And so because of that, React Natives is outperformed in that, in that way. Um, but obviously having, like I said before, having that, that knowledge and that background in, in native code allows us to uh, feel confident to drop down in native layers when we need to. And it allows us to make a better decision in terms of trade-offs. Hey folks, this is Charles Maxwood and I just launched my book, The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. It's up on Amazon. We self-published it. I would love your support. If you want to go check it out, you can find it there. The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. Have a good one. Max out. Could I share a, a use case that we have from a client project that I've been on recently about native code? Perfect. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's slightly different than what we've gotten into. Um, so I won't give too many details, client NDA, things like that. Um, but this app we're working on is an Android app and we have uh, hardware device integration. So there's actual hardware peripherals that we're connecting with. And so those peripherals um, have their own native libraries for Android. Um, we actually went with Android because there, there's more, more, more updated uh, you know, interface libraries for those for the kind of hardware we wanted to look into than on the iOS side, although we're hoping to get to iOS at some point as well. And so like, th this is a different case where it's like, okay, I, I have physical hardware sitting here. I need to connect with it. JavaScript is not going to allow me to do that. I need to kind of go through the native layer. Um, so I was not on the project and involved in the initial setup decisions, um, but I've kind of gotten to join in. And again, I'm not developing on the Android side. I'm a consumer. So I'm a JavaScript developer. Um, one of my coworkers and uh, several of the client developers are working in the native uh, layer in Android. But so some of the interesting things that have come up for us uh, are, uh, so like, like there's a few different needs we have. So like, first of all, if nothing else, we need to expose these native um, driver libraries to JavaScript. So if nothing else, we need to just kind of pass them through so we can make the calls to interface with these hardware devices. Um, but we're going a step beyond that and saying, okay, well, we're not trying to create a generalized library for anybody to access these hardware devices. We're trying to build something that's specific to our application. And in fact, uh, we're wanting these hard, this hardware to ultimately be kind of interchangeable, that uh, people can use similar classes of devices uh, and uh, that they're not locked into just one. And so we're also changing the interface of what's exposed. So instead of just passing through all the methods and functions and data structures exactly the same, we're creating our own interface that we want to expose with a different implementation underneath. 
And so uh, folks that have been developing for a while, this may be a pattern that's familiar to you um, when you have, uh, I forget the name of the, the related design patterns, but just the idea of separating in interface and implementation or adapting. I think adapter might be the name of the design pattern. You know, adapting an API that a third party exposes and saying, well, what's the API that my application needs? It can make it simpler to call it um, because instead of a sequence where your JavaScript code needs to call three things in order always, um, you could just have one method that you call and that, that handles that under the hood. And so that can sort of expose a more simple uh, interface there. It also uh, makes adjustments so that you can swap it out. So you say, okay, at this, um, the adapter layer, like, okay, whatever hardware device of this class, um, we use whatever ones we want to put in in the future, they're going to have the same interface. And you won't get it perfect. Uh, we are noticing that some things are weird and unexpected about what's happening at the native level. Um, you know, some of them are popping up a, a native UI that we wouldn't expect to be. It's like, oh, well, we were just kind of hoping you give us a function. It's like, no, we got to pop up a UI. Okay, all right. Well, so it's it's messy, and like we, we adapt the interface as we go. So it's not like we're going to get it perfectly right from the start. But the goal is always to be moving towards like what is an interface. Uh, that's adapted towards our application. And I should qualify in case the term isn't clear. I'm not referring to user interface here, but referring to like, what is the, the interface of the code? Like what are the publicly available functions or methods that are exposed versus the internal implementation? Um, and there's one more, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So that, yeah, I think that was the third level I was gonna get to as well. Is like, it's not just adapting the interface to what we wanna use, it's also adapting it to be standardized so that whichever hardware device we have under the hood of a different class, that hopefully that could be just swapped out. Hopefully there's literally a screen in the app where you just choose which hardware device you're using or you will automatically detect it. And then, but all the JavaScript code is just the same. And this might be something where in a typical React or just UI focused React Native application, maybe that doesn't come up. You don't really need to abstract away implementation details. It's okay if your application knows that you're using Redux or Mavic state tree for the data layer because you're probably not gonna change it. Um, but this is a case where, yeah, you know, different hardware devices is a really good reason that we would need to change the, the implementation of what's happening under the hood. So we've seen a lot of value of trying to focus on a standardized interface there. Yeah, uh, this has been a, a challenge for the WebView team uh, because we've, you know, we've tried to keep as much of a, a common interface between Android and iOS for, for obvious reasons for the WebView. Uh, but the, the thing is, it's helpful that Apple steals from Google and Google steals from Apple when it comes to these things. It's certainly very helpful. I mean, you look at something like, I'm blanking on the name of the the, the VR uh, system, Core. Uh, one uh, of the Apple one, I guess, is AR Kit and the Google AR one's AR Core. Maybe? AR Core, correct. Thank you very much, uh, Josh. Uh, so AR Kit, AR Core, you know, like Google was already working on one. They, they literally just renamed it to be more like Apple's uh, <laughs> when when AR Kit was was uh, was announced, and so and then they borrowed concepts from each other because ultimately that's that's just what they do. That's good for us, uh, even though they're you know technically stealing kind of ideas from each other. We want them to. We want them to standardize as mu many of their APIs as possible. It makes our job as developers much easier. It makes it easier to uh, to learn. But there's always little changes. There's always little differences in how they handle things. You know how how they handle cookies, for example, or how they handle um, uh, cross sites. You know cross site scripting uh, protection and things like that. Uh, those are the things that we we have to sometimes just say. Well, this is only supported in Android. It only makes sense in Android. Uh, the on the iOS side, you do things a completely different way. So uh, this property is only supported on the Android side, or vice versa. And and we've uh, we've kind of given up on the idea of 100% parity between the two, uh, and we just we just try to support what we can. Overall, though, the the main things, the most important things, are supported cross platform. So you can just write one piece of code and it'll work on both. Going way back, I built and I I'm actually not totally sure when I last worked on this. Um, I think it was probably 2014. So. Yeah, six years ago, I I actually implemented a uh, a MIDI player in an app. Uh, so this was prior to React Native. However, I did have to write some native code inter integrations. Um, this was a originally a Ruby Motion app, and I had to write some Objective C, and not just Objective C, but C. Actually, I'd write C to glue all this together uh, because there was nothing 
that played MIDI natively uh, in Objective C. They didn't expose APIs for that. That just didn't seem to be something they were that they had a lot of demand for. Maybe, uh, but I wanted to play some MIDI files, and so I actually found a C library, integrated it into Objective C, and and made that work. And it was really cool when it actually did work. So that's also possible. This is getting way deep into the weeds. This is something that you probably wouldn't need to do, but you can actually integrate C libraries at the lowest level if you, if you know how to connect all this stuff together. One thing to watch out though for is Apple scrutinizes this type of code very closely. And if you use any sort of undocumented private APIs, they may reject your app before it gets into the app store. Google may as well, but they're a little more uh, lenient in this sort of thing. I have nothing to add to that discussion other than I'm very impressed that you've done C code. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I skipped over that uh, time frame and uh, was kind of going straight to web development. Um, and I just recently picked up like the original book on C just because I was like, oh, it, it underlies all the things. It's underneath Objective C. It's underneath you know C plus plus. Like it'd be kind of nice to see it. And uh, yeah, I, I saw a tweet at one point that said that in the C language, uh, strings like like you know text strings are don't exist, but they're just a shared community hallucination and a social contract. And I was like, that just kind of gives you a sense of how low level <laughs> it actually is. Um, yeah. So it's, it's interesting. You can, uh, and, but it, like, it's, it's so interesting. Like objective C is kind of written with, you know, it exposes C um, in some yeah, senses, totally. if you look at Golang or if you look at rust, if you kind of get down to those levels, um, there's certainly influence, you know, C was definitely the, you know, the level back, like the sort of like common thread in the standard programming language that things diverge from. And ultimately it does underlie what's happening in our mobile devices and our desktops and things like that. Um, so it is a, it is a challenge that I've not quite gotten myself to. Um, but, uh, it's, uh, it, it has a significant point in the uh, history of computing for sure. And, and continued, continued use. Yeah, I don't intend to do any more, and, and I only did a little bit, uh, but it was it was very interesting for sure. I'm glad that there's a lot of libraries out there, really, when it comes down to it, because calling a C function isn't much different than calling a, a JavaScript function. But but yeah, if you're trying to do something new and innovative with C, then you're going to need to know like the the very low level stuff. And that's kind of I think that dovetails a little bit into this discussion. Like, how low do you go? How, how far down do you need to go? At the very highest levels, you can do something like DraftBit where it kind of allows you to, to build a, a, an app kind of no code style. So you can start with kind of like that high level, um, but then you can go down a little lower and you can go with something like Expo where there is code, but you don't touch native. It's, it's very much like a guided experience. Here's your, here's your JavaScript, allows you to, to build out very, uh, a lot of different apps. And we're actually working on an Expo app right now uh, but this new new app that came in that needs that integration with PayPal wouldn't work with Expo. So now we got to go a little deeper and we're building it using Ignite and, and the, the React Native uh, uh, CLI that allows you to build a uh, fully you know, integrated uh, native and React Native apps. Uh, and then you, know, you can go even deeper than that and do native apps. C apps, like you can go as deep as you want. So it's it always comes down to like what are the trade-offs. Honestly, I I go as high as I can without without hobbling myself and making myself do these weird workarounds to make something work too often. In some cases, like like if we built like a Shopify website or something like that, we're having to kind of work around its limitations in order to make do what we need to do. Where if we did a Ruby on Rails site, it doesn't come with all this extra uh, awesome stuff but uh, you can build whatever you want. So yeah, it's, it's just a continuum of, of, of where, uh, a, a gradient of like, where do you wanna be? Uh, and do you wanna be on the high level, but with more guardrails in place? Do you wanna be low level where you're having to build a lot more yourself and understand a lot more, uh, but you have way more power available to you? Yeah, in the past when the boundaries between things were clearer, there was fewer decisions to be made. Like you want to build a native app, you build it with the, the tools that the platform provides. Um, you, you want to build a web app, like, well, they, they run on the server and they send HTML down. And so pick a language, but like, it's going to be server rendered. That's the way it goes. Um, there's so many more options these days, which is great. It also makes the decision process uh, challenging. You know, folks talk about JavaScript fatigue, and I feel like a lot of things in the JavaScript framework and library world are settling. It's platform fatigue for me. It's like, oh, I have so many options now. How do I choose? It's, is it web? Is it native? But, and, and I think just a common bit of advice I hear on that is just so helpful that, you know, just 
pick something to start with. Like, you know, as, as long as you know the most important things in your app that you're going to need, uh, you know, you're probably not going to paint yourself into a corner. Um, you know, just know if your app needs access to native devices that a uh, native device functionality that browsers don't provide. And if it does, then don't build a web app, build a native app instead. Um, but other than that, um, like you're, you're probably going to be fine. And certainly from the standpoint of your career, um, you know, just like all of these, these libraries and frameworks and platforms are valuable and have different purposes and they have a place and none of them is going away. And so I, I encourage folks individually to just pick something that's interesting to you. Um, and for a company, just kind of know your constraints and pick a platform that is not going to paint you in a corner and, and you'll be good to go. Any last uh, thoughts or input folks before we go to picks? All right, let's do it. Um, I have a few uh, this week. Uh, the first one is a humorous one. Um, have either of y'all run across uh, uh, Screen Rants pitch meetings, these uh, humorous videos on YouTube? Uh, no, I have not. I have not, no. <laughs> these are, I, I have a whole collection of things like this. Honest Trailers is a series of videos that I find hilarious about movies. Uh, Cinema Sins, uh, they do everything wrong with this movie. Um, so those are hilarious. But pitch meetings is the latest one that I've found. Um, it's about a, a screenwriter going into a meeting with uh, a producer and pitching a movie. And it's like you know, all the popular movies, the Marvel movies, the Star Wars movies. Um, they're very uh, mimetic, uh, just they have a lot of catchphrases they repeat, but it's, it's hilarious. I think I binge watched all 160 of them now or so. Um, and they're influencing my thinking. Like I, the, the phrases from it are coming out in my marriage at work. Uh, they could get me in trouble at some point, so we'll see. Um, but I, I just think they're hilarious and uh, really That's great. Uh, great comments about uh, the processes that might be going on behind the scenes for some of these decisions in movies that you're not sure how they got made. So pitch meetings are really, really funny. Check them out. Um, the other one is, is, is helpful. Maybe this will, will help my family life on the flip side. So, you know, there's a lot, you know, when it comes to parenting, anybody that's a parent, there's lots of different views on parenting. Um, and, you know, everybody, please feel free to parent the way you see fit. Um, here's a resource that's been really helpful for my wife and I. Um, it's called Peaceful Parent Happy Kids. Um, it's a, there's a book. Um, there's also an online course. I think one of them is starting just a few days after this recording. So you'll probably miss that. But another one will be coming along um, a few months later. Um, but it's specifically around, I mean, I, I think parenting is probably unavoidably stressful. It's just challenging. You have these little creatures in your house. Um, but this book and course have been really helpful for us to get perspective. Um, and it matches up with a lot of how we understand parenting in terms of uh, that it in our view, that it doesn't need to be about mainly about rules. It doesn't need to mainly be about forcing your kids to do something. Uh, that relationship um, can be a core of it. And it is sort of a messier approach to take because things aren't black and white, but we've seen a lot of benefit and just, just great interactions with our kids coming out of it. So Peaceful Parent, Happy Kids is a great book and course if anybody uh, would like to check it out and you know check out the summary of it and see if it lines up with how you think about parenting, but it's been real helpful to us. That's really cool. Thank you. My son's about to turn two and he is just a different kind of guy every day. So <laughs> I, I don't think you know how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At the age Absolutely. of two, that's when it started to go from just biologically, like keeping things going to like, Oh, they have a, a personality in the relationship and like we're having conversations and, and what do I say? Totally. Yeah. Chris, how about you? What picks do you have for us? Yeah. Mine, uh, mine's not super exciting. I mean, it's a, it's a popular book that's been around and I just have never gotten around to read it. And now I am going through it. It's the four hour work week. So, um, you know, it, it talks a lot about, there's a really like significant point in the book. He points out early where he says like, if you are productive, it has a lot to do with the new rich and kind of controlling your time. And, you know, he points out that if you're productive and you get a lot of work done and maybe a quarter of the time, that doesn't mean you need to work the nine to five social contract everybody wants you to work. So you should produce eight times as much because you're going to burn out. And I feel like I work remote. So I kind of feel that pressure a lot where I need to produce eight times the amount of work because I can be more productive at home. But it's not something that you can continuously do. And this book kind of kind of targets in on that. And I think it's a good book if you're just trying to avoid burnout. It kind of has some new perspectives that I think are really important. So I definitely want to choose that book and I'm very happy with it so far. So I'm excited to finish it. Yeah, I've never uh, read that book, but I've um, I've read a lot of, you know, uh, uh, just kind of quotes from it and, and, and different summaries of it and stuff. It seems very interesting. I have an idea for what you can do. And this is my pick for today. 
uh, with the other 36 hours of your week. Um, and that <laughs> is, I've been playing a new game with my son called Space Engineers. It's not actually new, it's been around for quite a few years. Um, but I absolutely love this game. It totally scratches the, uh, the, the engineer side of my brain, <clears throat> allows me to, um, to build, uh, build cool things, <clears throat> design amazing things. We get to work together. Last night I actually streamed on Twitch with my brother Denton, uh, who is a Twitch streamer. Uh, he usually, uh, streams Rust, um, but also with my son. So, uh, the three of us working and, uh, doing a brand new, space engineers uh, planet. The basic idea behind it is uh, you can explore the universe, you can uh, kind of build spaceships to fly between planets and, and different solar systems and stuff. But you can also just be on a planet and build things just on the planet and, you know, hang out on the planet. And so it's a very open world sandboxy feel. Uh, it's very collaborative. You can have, um, you can have enemies, you can do pay, player versus player if you want, there are public servers. Uh, but what I've done so far is just mostly like design cool rovers and spaceships and stuff and build them. And uh, there's also resources and things like that you have to collect. So yes, with uh, the other 36 hours that you've now freed up, Christopher, now you can start playing Space Engineers. I have a lot of time to fill now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many ideas. Well, cool. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for the discussion. That was really great to dig into native code and the options. And I hope the listeners have taken away some uh, understanding, even just from listening to it, um, and maybe some ideas for when the time is right to kind of dig in, go under the, uh, the hood, and understand more of what's going on in the native level. So thanks, everyone, and we'll uh, catch you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.